Am I audible now? Yes. Hi there. Is uh, Zoom comfortable? Yeah, it should be fine. I'm just trying to see one thing. I just want to make sure that I can share. Uh, let me see if this works. Can you? Let me know if you can enable screen sharing. Yeah. Yes, now we can share. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me just check. It looks like when I share, you're not able to hear me. So um, I guess I'll, I'll work without, I'll work a little bit without, uh, without slides then. Maybe we can just have a, is there a way to enable my audio when I share my screen? You can try, it was audible. You can try once. Uh, can you just try? Uh, now the screen is visible, but you are muted, okay. All right, um, two options. We can either move to Google Meet or I can uh, work without slides. What would you prefer? We can work without slides. Fine. Okay. All right. Great. So I'm ready to go then. Before starting the session, uh, I would welcome you to the event. Uh, Footprints 23 is a three day national level technical event held in our college from past 22 years. And this time we are celebrating 23rd year. We have started with segment of telescope, telescope uh, mentioning all the guests who can connect with us on virtual form. We already had one session by Amori Lewis, sir, and now we are moving on to your session. So before starting the session, I would request the faculty student coordinator and student dean of the Faculty of Technology to welcome you to the session. So, yeah. Great. Good morning. Good and morning. Namaskar. Hi. I welcome Dr. Virginia Sarma, ma'am, and uh, all the participants present here uh, for the expert lecture session at the event called as Footprints. Ma'am, for your information, this event is being organized from last 23 years in our faculty. That is the Faculty of Technology and Engineering the Maharaja Sajira University of Baroda, Gujarat, India. 
it is national level technical event which is uh, having a patronage from our honorable prime minister narendra modi it is also having patronage and uh, identification from chief minister and uh, uh, appreciation letter from chief minister gujarat state it is uh, recently received patronage from g20 also and uh, it is already having unesco patronage from at almost last 6 uh, years so, ma'am welcome to this uh, prestigious and uh, well known event uh, we are organizing at our faculty at national level and uh, request you to share your uh, experience for our uh, engineering students for the topic uh, living in crisis so that is rather uh, uh, we indian people are uh, learning how to live in uh, the most uh, happening crisis every day so uh, ma'am you can help us to make uh, because i always say to my students that uh, problems are everywhere we have to find out as an engineer we have to find out the solution of the problem so in uh, living in crisis uh, definitely your experience ma'am will lead us to know how we have to find out the solutions and how ultimately we can live living in crisis we can happily uh, play the role in every instant of the life for living in crisis welcome welcome thank you so much so the topic i'm going to be covering is leading in crisis uh, i've been in leadership roles for uh, for a couple of decades now and i thought it would be useful uh for all of you first of all welcome uh to and happy new year to all of you in 2023 and thank you for the invitation um and i was thinking about what would be a useful topic given the fact that all of you have already lived in crisis uh i would say that that your particular generation of of um you know upcoming professionals have probably experienced um uh you know crisis through the pandemic in a way that probably none of us had uh in our in our uh you know uh pre-work days and i think that that's going to um uh it it's going to impact the way that you make sense of crisis coming uh which will which will come future crisis it will impact the way you respond to those crises it will impact the way that you lead in those crises you know you that you hear about um our uh forefathers and previous generations who lived through the partition uh you know uh people who lived through the great depression people that lived through the world wars and you see that many years into their careers uh many years into their lives the way they uh, react to situations the way they manage money the way they manage people was deeply impacted by what happened to them uh at a ver- very similar age that you all are um and so uh in one hand you can deny it you can say you know what the pandemic happened let's just uh pretend that we're going to all go back to normal and um there's there's uh the reality is embracing your experiences that you all have been through all of us have been through that experience but you in particular embracing that as part of an identity and as a mental map um and understanding that you will be faced with future situations of crisis and recognizing that what you've experienced in the last few years and your whole lives are going to impact the kind of leader you're going to be um i almost find that embracing that um into your identity is better than denying it you're not going to be the kind of leader i've been uh because i have not lived your experiences right uh you have not lived mine so i think that um my first uh, thing that i really thought about you all is uh you know in in a few years all of you are going to be uh managers and leaders in organizations uh and i think that it would be useful to to make you aware and help you embrace uh 
the kind of leader that you're going to be. And for that, I really want to highlight um, two things that I wish people would have told me, or maybe three things people I wish that would have told me when I was in college. Unfortunately, I didn't benefit from these type of lectures when I was in university. Um, the first thing is, is that there is a, um, a shift in the way you all think about uh, leadership and gender, right? I think, I think that uh, there is an acknowledgement that there are stereotypes uh, about how women lead, about how men lead. Um, I think as I was growing in the ranks when I joined the workforce in 1999, it was still the heyday of the um, larger than life, aggressive, very masculine leaders uh, that led industry, right? The, the, uh, the energy, uh, people always gravitated to that very uh, confident, assertive, sometimes aggressive, decisive, um, you know, uh, boss, right? This idea of a boss was, was still a thing. And that boss was, uh, you know, played to the galleries when it came to um, uh, being uh, rather directive, uh, really focused on driving people hard, inspiring through high energy, um, highly demanding workplace environments, right? And typically those traits are identified with male leaders, right? If you think about the, the you know, the, the Steve Bombers of Microsoft from back in the day versus the Satya Nadella of today. If you think about Jack Welch of GE from then, and you think about, you know, uh, you know a, a Sundar Pichai, who's our CEO now, you see a dramatic difference in how male leaders have evolved um, in even two decades of leadership. And that comes from the fact that recognizing that the next generation doesn't respond necessarily to actually a highly uh, masculine style of, and I use the word masculine not as a biological gender, but as a as a as a as a role identity gender, right? And what we're finding more and more is that uh, traits like compassion and empathy and collaboration, many traits that are uh, typically associated with a feminine style of leadership, are really impacting the way that even uh, CEOs today, largely male CEOs, are leading with success. Um, and you may think, you know, why did that happen? A, I think that that was a demand from the next generation to say, you know, we don't want to work in places that are toxic. We don't want to work in places that burn us out. We don't want to be treated like a serial number. So that was good energy. But the other reason why that happened is because of crises. In the last 20 years, we faced a, a you know global recession. Uh, the pandemic was not the first pandemic. There was SARS, there was swine flu. Um, we faced, uh, you know, a lot of hardships as it relates to that. And I think that when you when you come out of, um, you know, an experience of a, of the last twenty years of leadership, people have realized that, you know, organizations will not survive crises like these unless leaders are able to adapt to what people really need. So I think that as you enter the workforce, my first advice to you is, do you really understand what your masculine and feminine energies and capabilities are as individuals? And I don't mean that as you're a man, so you must be masculine, or you're a woman, so you must be feminine in terms of your leadership style, right? So, um, you know, if I had a slide, I would just kind of use some words to help you understand what these mean, but, um, you know, the types of attributes of masculine is aggressive, assertive, decisive, you know, competent, hierarchical, individualistic, in, you know, powerful, driven by money, ambition to achieve personal success, task oriented, directive. Whereas a feminine uh, type of a leader is cooperative, creative, empathetic, caring, communal, uh, sensitive, uh, able to listen and help younger colleagues, collaborative, compassionate, relationship-oriented, democratic, participative. So I just wanted to pause and read those out to you. First, to have you reflect, you know, are, are you a mix of these or did you, did you largely resonate with one or the other? And what we found is that leaders that actually are able to pull from both these columns 
are actually the most successful leaders. Actually, that's not me saying it. That's what research says. Um, we don't talk about it in the context of genders. Uh, we usually talk about it as, oh, these people are adaptive leaders or situational leaders. But let's face it, it's about pulling from the best of both genders, right? So, so I sometimes affectionately kind of talk about like sort of how do you actually move away from diversity in the context of number of men and number of women in a room and move it to, you know, diversity of, of your gender role identity, which is how many people that are truly balanced uh, are leading an organization. And one thing that we've actually found is when you have an organization that actually has an awareness of both these energies, you know, the empathy, the collaboration, but also being decisive, you need both. You're able to overcome crisis more smoothly. Crisis will come. And why, why these organizations are able to do that is because typically more balanced leaders are have a more group orientation. They don't have an individual orientation. And what I mean by that is, um, if you think about an organization as a, a production or a show or an act, right? An individualistic leader, a highly masculine leader, will really see themselves as the protagonist of that play. I am the one, there's a lot of, I am the one that needs to find the answer. I am responsible for everything. There's a deep sense of I in that story, which is the solution resides with me. The problems have to sit with me. I alone can actually manage this. Everybody has to come to me. There's a burden of being individualistic, which is in a crisis, you think you have to be the one that has to run into the fire, right? So it's not necessarily good or bad. It's just what it is. Whereas when you have a group orientation, you're a more balanced leader of a mix of masculine and feminine, you're actually going to think about it in the context of the answer resides in the group. So you're more of a producer of the play versus the lead actor of the play, right? You're not the hero of the story. You're the producer of the story. And so you really look at, you know, not how can I help? How can I solve this? But who can help? You're more natural, you're more comfortable, and you don't have an ego about seeking for expertise in the group. Somebody has the answer. This group within us will find a way to go through this situation together. And so your natural reaction is not to actually have an answer, but to seek the answer. So you're you're, you're not a problem solver, you're a solution finder. You can imagine in a crisis, if you're able to turn to the group for solutions and you're able to orchestrate the different people that are good at those things, regardless of their job title, regardless of their, you know, their level, regardless of everything, but you find people that could be good at coordination or you know, analysis or you, know, you, you will be more successful at, at leading in a crisis. The second thing that we've actually found is that at that moment of crisis, all of us go into two modes, right, as leaders. One is a preserve mode, okay? Uh, preservation uh, doesn't necessarily have to be preservation, um, you know, that, uh, but it tends to be about what do I first need to make sure that my role, my position, my power, my team, my resources, my territory is protected. So your first reaction is to lock the gates, right? Which is what can I do to actually make sure that whatever else is happening in the world, the little part of the world that I control and that I influence is fine. Now that doesn't mean that they're going to actually save themselves and not save their team. They will save their immediate team. So in a, in a layoff, in an economic recession, they're gonna be very focused on making sure that their team lands well, lands fine. So their team loves them. You know, a highly individualistic, a highly preservation-oriented leader is actually going to come out with a lot of loyalty by their team because the team rallies and trusts that person to take care of them, right? But when you think about a crisis in an organization, you might be able to save the headcount of 5, 10, 50 people, right? But if the whole organization is bleeding money or there's no sales happening, is that really the right answer for the solution to put a, put a moat around your org, right? To be that individualistic. On the flip side, you know, 
more balanced leaders think about it in terms of perform. And what I mean by instead of pre preserve, there's perform. Performance oriented leaders are, yes, they care about their teams. They don't want their teams to fall sick and everything else, but they're very focused on moving the ship forward, right? If you're only focused on surviving the immediate crisis, you're not thinking about the future of the organization. You're not thinking about life after the crisis. A performance oriented, uh, group oriented leader is really optimistic that we're gonna come out of this crisis at some point. And at that point, are you really positioned to be a leader in your organization, in your industry? What that means is they're not going to be swayed by emotion necessarily. Uh, they're not gonna be swayed by oh, you know, we need to actually save, you know, we need to make sure that everybody likes our decisions. They're not necessarily the most popular leader. So you can be group oriented and uh, performance oriented, but you're not necessarily popular because you have to make hard decisions. And so I give you this framework. I want you to visualize a two by two grid on the Y axis. You have group orientation versus individual orientation. And on the x-axis, you have a performance orientation and you have a preservation orientation. And what we've typically found is that balanced leaders that have a mix of masculine and feminine leadership styles are on the top right. They're group oriented and they're performance oriented. So they're not seeking to be popular. They're not seeking to be famous, but they're highly effective, especially in a crisis. The leaders that tend to be very high on masculine tend to be on the bottom left, which is, and also on the bottom right, but it's mostly individual orientation and very much focused on, you know, being the hero of the story and preserving whatever they have control over. And highly feminine leaders tend to be on the top left, which is highly group oriented, but also preservationist. And what I mean by that is you will have a lot of feminine leaders that will not focus on the results of the organization, the future of the organization, but they will have high level of empathy towards people's needs, high level of empathy towards, okay, let's put our talent first. Let's put our humans first. Let's make sure they're comfortable. They're happy. The problem is all happy organizations with nice cafeterias and good facilities and nice perks and a nice gym right? A lot of startups you see offer a lot of these benefits to make sure they're very happy places, but they're bleeding money. They're not going to survive big crisis. So high levels of feminine energy are also not good for an organization because they're too focused on their people. You'll say, Virginia, how can you say that? Of course, if you focus on people, everything will happen. No, it won't. In a crisis, you have to make sure that the institution has longevity. It survives that situation, right? So I give you this framework because as you think about the companies that you will interview with post your graduate, you know, as you go through, you will meet leaders in your interviews. You will watch their videos. Look for these signals of whether they have a group orientation and individual orientation. It, they might say great things. They have a high people or group orientation, but are they really, do they have a vision for moving their organization through a crisis? Do they have a view of organization longevity? Do they have balanced leadership across feminine and masculine? And it doesn't matter if these leaders are male or female. I keep wanting to emphasize that. Do not worry about biological gender. I know it's not a popular thing to say. A lot of people like in corporate to say we should have, uh, you know, DEI, we should have equal number of male and female. Like you would think that I would be a big advocate of, you know, I'm, you know, I'm an ind independent board director and we should have 50% women in boards. All that is fine. But if those women are high masculine, right, and they don't have that group orientation, they don't have a balanced leadership style, how is that boardroom diverse? How are they making organizational decisions that benefit the organization? So I don't, it's not that I don't buy into it. The research says that biological gender is not a determination of leadership effectiveness. Right. So the rest of that is all stereotypes. So I just wanted to plant this one seed with you all, because I believe that you have the opportunity of not being biased by decades of stereotypes in corporate. You don't have to worry about 
uh, women are like this, men are like this, because many of you all have grown up in households where your parents are more equal. You have been given opportunities to be an equal participant. You're an engineering college. You don't, you won't be held back as much as some of the previous generations. So don't start your careers with being shackled with some of the garbage that uh, we might tell you because we've been doing this for 20 years. All of that is nonsense. Like focus on being balanced leaders, focus on helping your organization perform in a crisis, focus on organizations that have a group orientation. And, um, you know, that's a, that's just part of my formal talk. I want to turn it over to any questions. I can also, in Q&A, take any questions about my career journey, which has been quite uh, a jalebi, if you will. I do not have a linear career. I have a, I've done a lot of different things, so I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Actually, we also have many questions from our side to ask you because sure. of the, uh, your whole career. Before beginning, I saw a video of yours once uh, where you were talking about networking through LinkedIn. So how as we are going to start our career, so how we can take that benefit before entering into the corporate culture? Yeah, I think first things first is make sure that you obviously have a, a LinkedIn profile that... Uh, you know, it's, a, you know, two, two or three things that I think are very important on LinkedIn profiles. Believe it or not, have a good profile picture. Do not have a picture that is taken on your selfie stick in the mountains where you are 20% of the picture. It is not your Insta picture. It is not your, it is a proper, and it should not also be your passport photo, right? Passport photos are like the most miserable photos I've ever seen, right? And why is that? If I want to work with a colleague, it needs to be a somewhat pleasant co colleague, right? I'm going to gravitate towards people that look pleasant, not good looking, bad looking, attractive. You don't have to put filters and all this stuff, but at least look like a pleasant person, have a small smile, look relatively accessible, right? Second thing is be very thoughtful about uh, the brand you're building as you're sharing content on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is not a CV, right? LinkedIn is a content platform. So I oftentimes see people share thoughts and ideas about everything. You know, they care about this, they care about that. And so what happens is the world does not want to know your opinion about everything in the world. The world doesn't want to know my opinion about everything in the world, right? But pick a few things that you care about and make sure that you're not only writing content or sharing articles about those topics, but find other influencers or people on LinkedIn that are talking about the same topic and you're better off leaving a comment on somebody else's LinkedIn. Leaving comments on other people's posts is more important than writing your own posts. That's a little known fact about LinkedIn. A lot of people think that LinkedIn is like, uh, like a typical one, like a communications medium. I have to write articles like on medium. I need to publish, I need to do a video. No, you will get more benefit of the LinkedIn algorithm if you engage with people and their threads. So a lot of people say, how did you become a LinkedIn influencer? You know, how did you get the blue tick or the blue in thing? For many years, I've been talking about gender inequity well before I did my thesis in this space. I would say that I started really finding my voice when I started engaging with other people's posts. You know, somebody will write a blog, I'll leave a comment. My comment will generate three other comments. Those three comments will generate five comments. Those five comments will generate 20, you know, thumbs up or whatever. That, I, the, the, the algorithm loves conversation. So I meet a lot of C-suite that says, I wrote an article on LinkedIn and nobody came to read it. And I ask them a very simple question. When you go to LinkedIn, after you post your article, did you read anybody else's article? No. Did you leave a thumbs up or, a, a, you know, a, you know, did you react to anybody else's content? No. Did you leave a comment for anybody else? No. I said, so you just went out there, you put your post, you left, and you came back and nobody did anything with your, with your post. They said, yeah, but when I do articles in economic times, you know, this and that. I said, this is not a newspaper. Please get out of that, right? This is also not like Insta, right? The number of people liking your comments is irrelevant how your thought process, how your comment influence somebody else's thinking is more important, right? So 
I would say if you don't want to be an active writer on LinkedIn, no problem. Take time out to actually network with people through their comments. You'll meet lots of interesting people. In fact, some of the best uh, people that I've seen are people who leave thoughtful comments, especially students. I always read their comments more than their in-mails or their connection requests. I'll read an, I'll read a thoughtful comment from them. And then when I actually connect with them offline, I know that they're a thoughtful person. If I can say that for an event, then if we are holding a LinkedIn profile of an event, can we do the same for that? If you want to grow? Yeah, I mean, I think that what you have to think about is um, LinkedIn now has, LinkedIn is not an events platform for uh like you either have company pages or you have individuals pages, right? I would really want all of you to be promoting, you know, Kaleidoscope on your networks, right? And the, the, the event page is just a destination to find out more information. But people don't engage with events just like people don't engage with buildings, right? So companies are not what they engage with. They engage with people in those companies. So they want to know who you are. They want to chat with you. They want to see your faces, your videos, et cetera. Use the company page to amplify what your individual members are talking about, is what I would say. That was nice. Uh, one of the team members wants to ask that, what are the problems faced as a woman who is leading a team or you have been a marketing head for a long time? That any problems you faced during your journey? You know, Every time I face a problem, I remind myself that I'm just doing marketing. I'm not saving lives. <laughs> so none of the problems that I face on a day-to-day -day basis actually means that somebody might, you know, so I always put, put those into perspective. But um, I don't think that I have faced a, an issue being a female marketer in, in tech. Um, I think that where I have, um, what I have observed and what I am thoughtful about is when you are a, a female marketer working with a largely tech sales team, which tends to be more men, I've been on both marketing and sales side. So, uh, you know, I've, I've done both. I've observed that women tend to volunteer themselves and it tends to be marketing into a lot of what I call work wife jobs. And what I mean by that is, are you the person that always buys the birthday present for the person on the team? Are you always the person that's organizing the office party? Uh, is the culture committee largely women, right? And are you the one who usually orders the lunch for a meeting? And what you typically fall into a trap of when you are a woman in the workplace, and especially if you are in women in marketing, is you're assumed to have very good um, event management skills, right? So what you'll start to see is you'll see a lot of women running events and you'll see a lot of men in sales and operations. The assumption is women are better organizers of humans and men are better with numbers and men are better with driving revenue. As you grow in your career, you can see how that holds women back, right? So I think it's unintentional, right? I also think that there is, unfortunately, I, I see this in my household and I correct it with my, with my spouse. Uh, Nobody is bad at cooking. Nobody is bad at remembering things. Nobody is bad at cleaning. It's a, everybody can become good at cooking, cleaning, and everything else if they decide that they want to do it. Just like that, if men can start learning to cook clean and participate in the house, right? Women can learn how to be better with finances. Women can be better at, you know, customer-facing roles. Women can be uh, great at, you know, audit committees, et cetera, and boards. So, I think that there's a comfort of people going into what the stereotype tells them that they can do. So I gave the stories around leadership, but that happens in everyday jobs. So the next time somebody actually says, can you order the lunch? Say no as a woman, 
Or can you organize the birthday cake? Say, no, I don't have time, right? Have, if there's a social event to be planned, have the guys do it. The next time that there is a budget planning thing where you have to organize and do the data analysis, you know, be a data-driven technical person. Don't, don't go into your corners because it's convenient and easy and society has a level of comfort on that. So I actively discourage women from playing the work wife role. Uh, work wives grow up in those meetings to always be that person that's designated those jobs. Take the minutes of the meeting, you know, organize the agenda, send out the action items, follow up with people. And my point to people is you will not find your mother in your office, right? I am not your mother, I'm your colleague, right? So don't expect those maternal instincts to come out on how I organize your life, be an adult. So be conscious of these biases. Women have them and men have them. Women raise their hand first. Yes, I'll organize the group. Why? Don't, right? Break the stereotype, say no, right? And the men buy birthday cakes, you know, start there. <laughs> That was actually a thoughtful approach. Next question is, you have been at various companies right now. So can you, you know, share your views on office politics? Any? You know, office politics um, is really driven, as I've interpreted it, as there is a um, something I've learned, two things I've learned uh, later in my career that I wish I, I learned earlier. You know, all this stuff with with Sheryl Sandberg saying, lean in, lean in, lean in, you know, and one thing that happens when you lean in, like if I'm leaning in, right, because I'm interested, I'm curious, I want to know more, you know, I want to be involved, is that you're so focused on your own contribution and the way like you are in that process, in that meeting or whatever, that sometimes leaning back gives you the opportunity to see what's really going on in the room. And a skill that for some reason we don't teach or we don't emphasize in, in colleges is how to read a room. When you read a room, uh, you have to understand things like everyone is driven, it's not politics. Everyone has a set of you know, OKRs or metrics that drive their success. Remember what I said about preserve. So when you start reading a room, you start understanding after a while with masculine and feminine energy, you don't need a survey tool, which there is one to understand what people are like. You can actually read the room to see who are the people that are high feminine, high masculine mixed because of the way they speak. So what will happen is that if you understand people's gender identity, you will understand the office politics. If you know someone is high on preserve their team, and high on individual orientation, right? If you think about the framework I give you all, you'll understand office politics because you'll start understanding why is this person fighting so hard to, for their team when they're making no money, when they're a loss making unit. You'll understand why someone is constantly seeking inputs from the group. You'll understand why someone is constantly trying to be the hero of the group. That's not office politics. That's understanding that all of us come from a certain place and that's our our own gender role identity. It comes from years and years of conditioning. All of you are gonna be conditioned a certain way as well. Breaking that conditioning is very hard. So once you understand that the room is made up of these diverse people, you pick that up because you've now leaned back and you've seen ki kya ho raya, right? The best leaders balance the room. If you see a room that's going into high individual orientation, high preserve, you go the opposite, you go group and you go perform. Don't feed the beast, right? Because you have to rebalance the room. And this is not because you're a woman or a man, you have to rebalance the room to bring the perspective on what really matters, which is, you know, the, whatever the meeting is about. So office politics will go away for two reasons. Number one is office politics will go away when you understand everybody else's place that they're coming from. When you have the empathy to say, I am the way I am, but somebody else is the way they are because of their context and their circumstances. 
but also when you actually deliberately make efforts to actually rebalance the conversation to like somewhere in the middle, right? Because the answer is somewhere in the middle. The second thing is that office politics is sometimes driven, unfortunately, tops down by who is rewarded for having information. So for example, if you are a leader that indulges gossip, you're a leader that reacts to gossip. You're a leader that is influenced by what other people say, that, that this person is good or this person is bad or this person is not doing this. And you can see that the leader actually is, makes different decisions because of the office gossip. More people will seek gossip. More people will seek to get gossip because gossip is power. Gossip is access to the leader. The minute they figure out that the leader doesn't care about gossip and the leader is going to do what the leader is going to do based on asking everybody or looking at the data or whatever else. And that information is no longer power, right? Let's say that I say, you guys can say whatever you want, but I'm looking at the numbers and that's what I care about. Then the numbers become power right? Then the person doing the best numbers becomes the most important. So as a leader, you have to be very intentional about how much you indulge feedback. Like, I really think that feedback is very dangerous in an office space because feedback done poorly is people can actually put ideas in other people's mind, feedback about this person, feedback about that person. And then you decide this person is good and this person is bad. And then feedback becomes weaponized. So I always say, and I'm like, I, I hear your feedback. I may not accept your feedback, right? Everybody can give feedback, but doesn't mean that I take the feedback. So I think as you enter the office politics, lean back and really understand what you're working with. And second thing is watch how gossip, the role of gossip in an organization and do your best to not care about the gossip. You know, I'm not the most loved leader. I never will be. I give the toughest ratings. My team is the best performing and they have the toughest ratings, right? That's okay. I'm not here to win hearts. I'm here to make people successful, right? So I'm very clear about why I come to work. And that's not because I'm trying to actually win a popularity contest. So, but leaders drive this, unfortunately. It's not you, you guys. It'll be the leader that sets the tone of office politics. Uh, there are a few more questions. Can I take them? Sure. Go ahead. So a basic question, like what are must-have skills that a student must possess before entering to a corporate world? We are about to enter in a year or so. I think number one is please be easy to manage. I think the best advice I got from somebody to say, how, did, how are you going to be successful in your career? just don't be a challenge to manage, you know? So be, be someone that your manager looks at and say, wow, this person is just really easy to manage. They take feedback. They're able to understand insights. They ask good questions. They always come prepared. Like, like I said, it goes back to the whole, I'm not your mother, I'm your manager. You know, like, I don't want to have to chase after you for things. The second thing is, is that, you know, a lot of people come into the organization and their first year is great in a job because they're learning and they're taking a lot from the organization. They're getting a lot of onboarding. They're getting a lot of first time exposure. But one of the things that is a disservice to you and the organization is when you, when you figure out after one year that you're bored and you're not learning, your definition of learning has to change because until you start executing what you've learned and delivering output. I see a lot of CVs where people have done jobs that are one year, one and a half years <clears throat> and moved to a new company. And to me, and I see what they write about their experience, they've hardly experienced the work, right? They don't have the depth of actually executing. Um, and they haven't created that kind of closed loop of actually what, what someone once told me, which is two cycles in a business. Two cycles in a business are you join, you ramp up, you do a project, it's successful, but then after the project, you have a downturn. 
that particular project or that particular team performs poorly, but you play a role in bringing it back up. A lot of people, when they finish the first hump of having a successful project, say, Abhi ho gaya now, what else is there for me to do? Anything that goes up will come down. If you have a team that's performing well, it will underperform at some point. It will go through a challenge. The real learning is in that second trough, which is, you know, we had a great campaign. The first round of the campaign gave us great results. The second round did not. Okay, like go through the second trough. So force yourself to stay in jobs longer so you can actually experience two cycles of the business, right? The third thing that I would say is, um, you know, as, as I, I don't think people invest in writing properly anymore. I think emails are very poorly written. Just today, I had someone on my team who has like 20 years of experience, right, in marketing. I had to rewrite an email that he wrote because it was too, it was too verbose it was too casual and it was an invite to a senior leader in the industry. If I'm coaching people at 20 years on how to write emails, that's a problem. And the first advice that I got and the first coaching I got from my manager in my 20s is write good emails, check your typos. Like you're not gonna get anywhere if you actually have poor written skills. Communication, all of you guys will have good skills because a lot of universities force you to present and use the slides and do presentations and everything else. So I find very articulate people write very poorly. So if you look at a lot of my LinkedIn posts, I spend a lot of time writing full sentences. Like, you know, write. So that that's what I would say is be easy to manage, you know, be with the business as it goes through ups and downs a little bit longer than you feel is necessary. And third is write well. It was actually true in life also, as you move on from the downsides, then you actually realize that you have made something. Next, we move on like some questions related to marketing. Uh, what is the scope of marketing or management for the future if we are opting or in some your point of view? So I think marketing in the future is going to be a lot more operational than marketing today. And what I mean by that is, you know, tools like, you know, AI tools, et cetera, are largely going to automate copywriting and some of the other functions that marketing does, you know, just recently I was using chat GPT to my point about writing. Well, I had a small window where I had a lot of deliverables that I needed to get out. I had people out of the office over Christmas. I was able to on my own without my team really being around, get a bunch of things copywritten and out the door much faster. So, you know, do I really need a lot of a large team of, 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 communications people know. But everything that we do in marketing needs to actually impact the business. And what happens is that a lot of times people run a campaign. It's very creative. It's very exciting. It has really interesting digital metrics. It wins a couple of awards and people move on to the next campaign. But the reality is, is if you keep executing marketing activities and you're not, and it generates some kind of enthusiasm, excitement, awareness, demand. If you don't manage that demand into your business, right? You actually have no impact at all, right? So I've actually, my metrics, at, you know, at Google are not demand generation metrics. They are demand management metrics. I have to work very closely with the sales team to be able to convert that demand. Um, those, you know, leads should be followed up in, 24 hours, right? Sales leads should not be sitting there for 30 days without follow-up. You should understand what are the objections that customers have through the sales cycle. You should know and the, the, the opportunities that we lose in sales. Are you going back to understand the reasons why we lost? What were the objections in the product? What were the, if you're going into product management, if you're not looking at the sales data on the deals we lose, right? Um, you know, what is that famous analogy about the, the World War II plane that came back with, with bullet holes, right? 
if you're not looking at your data about why you lose deals, you're never going to build a good product, right? Because you're going to constantly think about the demand you generated, but not the deals that you close. So I think that marketers with very strong analytic skills, very strong data-driven skills that spend a lot of time in the operations of marketing. Um, I actually think the future CMOs are going to be operations people. They're not going to be creative people. And they're going to be salespeople. This is why a lot of salespeople get jobs in marketing because they know how to show the business impact of that. Uh, so, you know, I think that that's one thing. I think the second thing is um, the ability to not just execute great activities that face customers, but spend time with customers and really synthesize the voice of the market. Right now, there's too many surveys, there's too many, there's too many online polls, et cetera, that tell people what customers are thinking, right? Uh, my experience, you know, I sit on the board of a company. I actually sit on an industry board. I sit on a university board. I do marketing at Google. And I, you know, I even sit on, you know, the finance committee of my building. I sit in all these different groups of things. And one thing that I've discovered is what people tell you that the company cares about, what people say is, oh, you know, my, my CEO cares about this, or my board cares about this, or this is the most important metric. Marketers get very caught up in what they hear the right metric is. Like um, a lot of agency people will come back and say, you know, here's the cost per click, or here's the CPM, or here's the cost per lead. There is no meeting I've been on on any board meeting that ever talks about the metrics that marketing people talk about. I have never heard anybody use these metrics. And so we need to validate as marketing people, whatever English we're talking in marketing meetings, you know, this metric leads, CPMs, brand lift, whatever. Does anybody even care about this stuff? Because honestly, I wonder many times if marketing people build dashboards for marketing people. So they just are one big happy marketing family, but no one outside marketing cares, right? So we do all this stuff, but really the CEO doesn't talk about this stuff. So I would always validate what is the most important metric and uh, work towards the business metric. Don't worry about the marketing, metric. miss your marketing metric, but make your business metric. It was great. Uh, before bringing it to an end, one last question, like any must have skills, skills if anyone wants to move ahead in the career of marketing. You should be able to do the sales job of whatever thing you want to market. So if you're in the marketing of, you know, you know, a SaaS product, or if you're in the marketing of a, um, you know, even if it's a consumer product, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, this phone or this lipstick or this, this bottle of water or, you know, you know, selling, selling Zoom uh, subscriptions to universities, uh, you should constantly calibrate that if you applied for a sales job today in that org, anywhere in that org, a revenue job, you know, sometimes it's a, you own the product PNL if you're in FMCG versus if you're in SAS, you should always be in a position to get that sales job. It doesn't mean that you're going to go and do that sales job. And the reason is you don't truly understand the value of the marketing that you're doing until you actually know how that product finally sells, right? And you should have an interest in selling the product and you should have the conviction to sell the product that you market. And if you yourself don't want that sales job because you don't think the product will sell, you don't think the product will be successful, you don't think you'll make your numbers, you don't have confidence in your selling skills, it means the product's not good enough for you to market. So be so confident that you'll be successful as a salesperson, then go do that marketing. I would never be the cloud marketing head if I didn't think Google Cloud was a good product. And that I, if I moved to sales tomorrow, would be successful and be able to make my quota. 
if I thought it was a crappy product, I would not be marketing. It was uh, really great having you here. Uh, to bring in and can you share your experience with Footprints or the whole session? And we would like to use it in the future on our website. Ke liye as a, uh, sure. Yeah, okay. best of luck. Uh, happy New Year to all of you. And uh, yeah, in you know, good luck with your conference. I'm sorry I could not be there in person. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, we have a group and a performance orientation. We're managing some of our costs right now, so travel is is uh, limited for me. Uh, but you know, best of luck and uh, yeah, stay in touch. Thank you so much, ma'am. All great. right, take care. Bye.